Hi. So what is science? So science is not just what we do in huge laboratories. You know? Science is what we do daily. So it all depends on what you ask. What question do you ask? What answers do you seek? So day to day, what we do has a lot of science in it. So especially children can actually start science and start doing scientific thinking very early. So there is a slight small demonstration of how that happens in this video. Brought to you by Real Learning Center where we focus on real learning. Okay, let's have this journey. Let's say you are a small boy or a girl and on a beautiful Sunday morning, okay, you are basically entering your you just got up and you are just entering your uh, kitchen. So once you enter your mother's kitchen and you see very nicely hot puris happening in the kitchen. Your mother is preparing hot puris. The moment you see these hot puris, what happens is your hunger, suddenly you feel hungry. But the moment you feel hungry, there is something else happened in your head. So there is a question that pops up in your mind. That question is, yes, I am seeing that the puri is puffing up in the oil. The moment you put it in the oil, it puffs up and becomes big, the puri. So why is it puffing up like that? So now you have in your mind, there is a question. And in your stomach, you are hungry. That is your state. During that state, what exactly you do? What do you do then? Do you satisfy your hunger of your stomach? Or are you going to satisfy your hunger for your brain? So you keep thinking, but it's a Sunday morning. And Sunday morning, what generally happens is your hunger is winning. You're very hungry, no? First you want to satisfy your hunger. So what happens, your mother gives you one plate of nice puris okay. and this, uh, uh, she says uh, she keeps it in front of you and she says uh, she will uh, go and bring some uh, chutney, you know, puri chutney and sago, she wants to bring that. In the back of your mind, the curiosity is still, run, still running, now why does it puff up like this? Okay. But in the front, you have very tasty puri standing there mother has gone to bring uh, the chutneys and you pick up a fork and you are just thinking and you take the fork and prick one of the puris. The moment you prick one puri, something hard came out of it. What came out of it? Is it uh, uh, some smoke or uh, was it uh, some steam? What came out of it? So your brain starts thinking. So on one hand, your brain is thinking, what, what came out of it in the background of your mind? So by then your mother brings chutney and uh, she gives you chutney and sambar along with uh, puri and you start eating. And once you finish uh, eating, okay, what is happening now once you finish eating? Eat, thinking is continuing in your head. Eating is happening here. So once you finish eating, your hunger is satisfied, your stomach is full. Okay. Once the stomach is full, the question that was till now dormant in your head starts uh, springing up again and you just ask uh, your mother, okay, mom, why does the puri puff up, amma? You ask your mother. So your mother is very intelligent. So she is, uh, she knows about many things and she says, no, that's a very simple reason for that. What happens is that there is water inside the, uh, the dough that I have prepared. No? I put dough, some water into the floor and prepare a dough. And that water which is there inside, that gets converted into steam when you heat up. Now when you heat water, it becomes steam. So once it becomes steam, it fills up inside the puri and puri puffs up wow suddenly you realize that you did one small experiment by pricking your uh, 
uh, fork into the puri and the steam came out. Now, wow, that is why steam came out when I pricked it. So you realize. So your experiment is suddenly matching with the theory that your mother gave and you are very, very happy. So you are now happy on two counts. So your stomach is full, satisfied, you are temporarily satisfied with the answer and your head is relaxed. So at that point you start observing around in the kitchen and you see that in the kitchen there are some puris which are uh, not puffed up at all, they are just uh, flat puris. Why are some puris flat? So what happened to our theory? Just now we, we, we discovered a theory, we said that uh, uh, water is uh, now converting into steam and that is puffing up the puri and all that, what happened to our theory? So suddenly you start wondering. So you start asking the question to your mother. Again, Amma, what is the reason these, these, these puris are not uh, puffing up at all? What happened to your theory? So she thinks about it, what may be the reason? And she thinks about her experiences. Uh, when does the puri puff up and when does it not? And she realizes that she it has puffed up whenever she has kneaded it very well. You know, you have this uh, uh, puri, which is the dough which you have to knead before. Okay, if you don't knead, it doesn't puff up. If you knead well, it puffs up. So how is it related to the steam? So you are confused. So your brain will again get into thinking mode. So the science in your brain continues. Though at this point there is confusion, there is no answer, but the brain continues to think. So that is what has happened. That is basically what a science that is happening in your head all the time. What is a scientific method? People say a scientific method involves many steps like observation, experimentation, developing theory, uh, finding exceptions, improving the theory. These are the many things that people say are the methods of science. Where are those methods in our science, in the kitchen science that we just now experienced in a sunny Sunday morning by eating nice puris? So, you see, what was our observation? You went into the kitchen and you looked at the puri which is puffing up. You have observed. The moment you have observed, you came back, you started thinking and then you did some experimentation. What experimentation did you do? You pricked the puri using a fork and you saw that it, it, the steam came up. And then you discussed with your mother and your mother actually came with her answer and we developed a theory. The theory is the, it, the water converts it into steam and that steam fills it. So nice theory you developed. And after developing a theory, then again you started observing and when you observed what you saw was there were some puris which actually did not puff up. So when that is an exception to your theory. So the theory was that every puri had to puff up. So it didn't. So now what do you do? So now you have to improve the theory. So to improve the theory you have to take inputs from many people. You asked your mother, she said it needed the kneading up. So then you have to read up somewhere and improve the theory. So tell me, when you go home and basically discuss these things with friends, will you improve the theory? So I am leaving this part to you to improve this theory and continue the science. So that basically is simply science happening here. And the science is happening day to day life, not just you. You think that I am talking about some puri science. So let's talk about real science and how real science, so-called real science happened. Okay, that is not very different. So you look at this guy, no? this guy is uh, a well-known, most famous scientist. Okay, this guy is who? Who is this guy? Have you seen him before? Maybe you can take a guess. And this guy is, not, is nothing but uh, the most famous Sir Isaac Newton. Okay, Newton was... Uh, one of the most famous scientists, and even today, I mean, most of the uh, most of the areas he worked on and contributed. Even Einstein had Newton's photo in his uh, uh, office and work area. He was such a famous guy. And what did he do? He actually came to mother's house uh, in Lincolnshire in England when he was studying. Okay, and he went into mother's garden and started thinking about things that he was 
studying about he had this big doubt what is this moon going around the earth and sun going around the uh, you know uh, sorry earth going around the sun uh, these are all uh, why are these happening who is responsible for this what kind of forces are responsible so his brain was always thinking about that while he was thinking that about that like how you entered your mother's kitchen he actually enters mother's garden in lincolnshire and sat there and he quickly saw he made one nice very nice simple observation he saw that one apple fell down from the apple tree and when apple fell down what would generally everybody do pick up the apple and eat but he started thinking it triggered his imagination and he came with this new theory which said that there is some relationship between apple falling down and moon going around the earth and earth going around the sun all are they linked they are all because of the same force so that force he called as gravitational force and he he developed something called as universal law of gravitation see here he just observed exactly like you you observed puris he observed apples nothing more but the brain kept thinking and developed a theory called universal law of gravitation which said that any two bodies actually attract each other if they have masses okay and the force of attraction is equal to product of their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them something like that that you will study in your classes okay he developed that theory and not just one theory he did lots and lots of observations some interesting observations he did he lots of questions he had in your mind like how you had your question about the puri he had many questions one of the questions he had was why rainbow has so many colors and when uh, he figured out that actually the white light has so many colors and when it is passed through the prism it splits into many colors and rainbow happens by that phenomena called dispersion okay he figured out that and then he also worked on the sun and moon we just now talked about and he discovered the law of gravity and then no he had this another doubt okay the far away planets and far away stars and all how can we see so he wanted to see so he developed a, a telescope called as a newtonian telescope and that telescope he used to actually watch jupiter and their moons there are four moons you can see in the from the of the jupiter saturn you can see rings using a, a telescope so i think this is one thing that you should ask your parents take us to a place where i can see jupiter's moons and saturn's rings through the telescope okay it is possible with a small telescope please ask this instead of asking for a birthday gift from your parents okay the next thing that he observed is how sound travels how do how do we hear echoes he worked on sound okay that is also what whatever we hear so he worked on that and developed his theories on that and very interestingly he developed another theory now if you keep a cup of milk on uh, a table it gradually it becomes cold okay so how long does it take to become cold so that doesn't even pass as a question in our head he thought about that and he calculated and made one long formula for that he called it's called as newton's law of cooling so like that he actually worked on many many more things and he was always curious he worked on many things and all the curiosities he tried to satisfy by working on it by asking questions by studying by experimenting and that's what is science okay and this is not so very different from what you are doing with the puris for example so if you have similar questions in your mind please pursue them ask the right people if you, if they don't answer you go to somebody else it is not their responsibility to answer it is your responsibility to find answers okay then you become a scientist i will talk about another guy before i depart so the other guy is you know when he was a small boy very cute looking boy you can see he had this hobby he used to go and observe and collect samples of lot of rocks small stones and rocks Okay, and he used to, you know, he used to be always uh, fascinated by the rocks. 
and he will put he will put them in one box and uh, uh, he'll keep it with him as a treasure. Okay, and he used to always study those rocks. And uh, he also used to collect the small insects, so they're called beetles. So he made a huge collection of the beetles, lot of them that you can see, huge collection of the beetles, small boy. Okay, and what is his name? His name is Charles Darwin. You might have heard about Charles Darwin who came with the theory of evolution. Okay. So he actually when he was a child, he uh, had all these hobbies and he developed into a, a young adult and went to the college. After that, you know, he was just still uh, very interested in the geology and natural sciences. Geology is about those stones, natural sciences. And one day what happened was during those days, Okay, there was this uh, uh, concept of going in the ship around the globe by the uh, you know the business people. Business people has had to take and do business with other continents and countries. They will uh, take one big ship and go around the globe and sell everything and come back. They also used to do some more interesting stuff, like for example, wherever they go, they collect specimens. Uh, of various animals and plants and compare them with uh, uh, other places uh, whether they are matching or not. They will uh, actually create uh, uh, various kinds of maps. So they used to do a lot of other work. So they wanted somebody who will actually uh, has some, who has some understanding of the nature like you know different kinds of plants and animals, birds and also the stones and rocks all that. So they figured out uh, that there is one boy or an adult, adult you know, basically he has already completed his uh, degree. So Charles Darwin uh, was very much interested and he, they came and uh, asked uh, his father. You know, there is this uh, ship called as HMS Beagle. Okay, there was the captain of the ship who basically gave the introduction of Charles Darwin and uh, he came to Char Darwin and asked. Darwin asked his father, father was saying, how long will it take? He said it will take about a year to go around the um, uh, go around the earth. So uh, he was like very reluctant to send his son for one year. But ultimately, you know, he said, "Okay, you go." And then uh, uh, Darwin was very happy, so he wanted to go around the world and see everything. So he travelled in the HMS Beagle, go around the world, uh, and they started from uh, England. So. If you look at uh, their journey, uh, where all it went and what they did, okay, you need to understand uh, the world map a little bit. Okay, if you see the world map, uh, world map is about uh, you know, it's a Earth, which is actually uh, unfolded and that becomes your map. Okay, that's what I'm just showing you on the screen here. When you unfold it, it looks something like this. Uh, England is somewhere there. Okay, from the England, uh, it, he went around South America and went around uh, the globe and came back towards Australia uh, and then reached uh, South Africa and then went up again back to England. Okay, that was his uh, path. So if you look at the, the ship movement, you get an idea about his path. Okay, the ship actually came from there to uh, South America and then went around South America, went to uh, the Galapagos Islands and then went around the earth and uh, came around Australia. Uh, then again to South Africa and back to South America and then up to uh, England. So in the whole journey he did a lot of work, you know, a lot of understanding of uh, uh, geology and uh, uh, he developed a lot of theories on geology also. But most important of all uh, was what he did when he was in an island called Galapagos Island. So you look at this Galapagos Island. So let's go to Galapagos Island somewhere here. So. This is a very interesting island. So if you expand the island a little bit, in a, in a zoom it up and see how it looks. See, the, this is not a, a single island. There are uh, many different pieces uh, of the island and, uh, uh, and uh, they all actually uh, are uh, not too far but at the same time not too near. It means one, one bird cannot, for example, fly from one island to the other island. So they are that uh, mm. far. Okay, so J Darwin actually observed very carefully <coughs> that these islands were some 
uh, time back, maybe several thousands of years back, they were actually a single island. Okay, if you map all the edges and then join together like a jigsaw puzzle, you can see that it was a single island. And then some earthquake or something which made it basically uh, many islands. So his theory was earlier there were lots of birds and other things which were there in the uh, one island and then they got separated and they grew there uh, for generations. And when he went around all of these islands and collected many specimens, what he realized was and his, his attention was drawn to one particular type of bird. So that bird is called as a, uh, finch, the name of the bird. So he carefully observed these birds. These were all those birds which he saw uh, in various islands. In all those small, small islands, all these birds were there. They were all very, very familiar um, to each other. Uh, in the sense that they were similar to each other and each one has a slightly different kind of a beak if you look at it. So he, his theory was that somehow these, these beaks actually were very very suitable for the food available in that particular small island. Uh, you know, wherever you know, if you had, uh, uh, if it has to catch some insects, the uh, beaks were like that. If it has to ground a nut, the beak was uh, uh, you know, somewhat blunt and strong. You would have to dig something into the uh, earth and uh, ca catch hold of some uh, earthworm, then its beak were actually suitable for that. So somehow somebody has designed their, their beaks which is suitable for that particular island. So it was very strange for him. How is that possible? So then uh, he thought about it. Why is the, all the other parts of the world remain same? Only beak changed. I think then his theory of these violence were once upon a time together. So he actually kind of very carefully observed these beaks. Now you can see the beaks. You know the the, the thicker beak uh, is meant for basically um, hitting something and making it uh, uh, you know uh, powder, okay, grain and all. Open the grain, okay, all that seed opening, that kind of a thing. So he actually uh, uh, somehow started thinking about this newly, very newly. First of all, first time in this. Uh, whole of our history, he started thinking about maybe they, are, they have been evolving. Okay, the word evolve started coming there. He started thinking about birds were similar but their beaks looked very different on each island. So he kind of thought about it and he also uh, made one big table of matching their beaks to what food is available there. So he came with this theory saying that these birds actually change through generations okay and depending on the environment around them their beaks got shaped up like not in one generation multiple every generation slight slight change slight change so his idea was that if there was actually a small difference in the beak uh, which would be basically supportive for that food habit and those finches would survive and they will reproduce and this, their children also look like them if the birds had different kind of uh, beaks which were not good for their survival in that particular island, those birds will ultimately die and cannot give birth. So uh, gradually the nature has selected in such a way that only those birds which are suitable, having suitable beaks actually remained in that. And he actually pushed this idea much further and said that not just birds but every animal and every plant actually uh, evolve, modify themselves through generations depending on the environment uh, around them. Then he continued and said that he even pushed his theory a little bit further and then he said that so animals and plants not only modify a little bit, they evolve into different animals and plants. So monkeys evolve into human beings, fishes evolve into whales, so it's like that and he very very uh, drastically uh, revolutionary theory he developed. So we said, he said that we evolved from monkeys in 10 lakh years and this theory is actually today known as Charles Darwin's theory of natural selection or his theory of evolution, it's also called theory of evolution okay. and it's a very 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 powerful theory and today this theory is well accepted in science 
that we were not created like this. We evolved from various different animals, uh, you know, like monkeys and even monkey evolved from some other animal like that. So this is uh, uh, all because that Charles Darwin pushed his thinking okay, and he explored and he observed and he experimented. So what we can conclude from all this is that Newton and Darwin in their childhood were very similar to other children. Okay, they had actually similar kind of questions and they had uh, conducted similar kind of experiments like any other child and they pushed through it and they continued their thinking throughout their adulthood and they came with new theories, they rejected the old theories and then they proved new theories. So like that they became great scientists. So it is possible that every child and he is actually a born scientist, child has this curiosity all the time. Okay, I want to find out why this is happening, why that is happening. So, if you actually do like Newton and uh, Darwin, if you observe well and think well and ask questions uh, and conduct experiments, you can also become a great scientist one day. Okay. So, and I am basically hoping that uh, every child will become a scientist okay, and all the best. Thank you.